On this episode, we are on location in Grove City, Ohio at Card Collector 2. What a banger, Danny. Super banger. <laughs> kind of went back in the time machine. A lot of nostalgia here today and a cool story. Yeah, Treadway. Yeah, it was cool. Ryan and I have been friends for a long time. It was cool to listen to him kind of tell his story to the world. It was super dope. Juicy Cole. Yeah, I mean, this podcast is just absolutely wet. Uh, <laughs> learned so much about cards. Great stories. I mean, in this place is amazing. Trayvon. Um, I just love, like, everything that, like, cards and all that just represents, like, how it, how you can turn, like, you know, a hobby into, like, something that's business and sports or life and everything. So I, I just love being here. Yeah, I'm excited for you guys to meet uh, Ryan as one of our homies learn from them and you know this definitely holds a place in my heart too because i started as a card collector so let's roll to the show roundtable podcast i'm your boy Corey g that is at small arms danny at trey speed and the graphic gangster himself cole susak we also added the beard to one tyler treadway and we are on location in Grove City, Ohio, at Card Collector 2 with Ryan Johnson, one of the G's in the game. And we're about to learn some shit about card collecting today. Right, Danny? Yeah, super wet place. Brings back a lot of memories. <laughs> Very wet. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's the dripping. first thing it's that dripping. Cole said when he walked in the door. <laughs> yeah. I literally said, oh, this is wet. You did. You did. You did. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I've known Ryan for a while now. It's super excited to kind of, it's like the uh, the crossover episode. So it's it is. cool. It's like uh, meshing two things and super excited for Ryan to tell a story on kind of a different platform. Yeah, it's hard to follow up the wet boys, right? When yeah. they, they start to come. <laughs> Trayvon? That's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, just being here just got me thinking about all the cards I have at PSA. So I'm just waiting for those to get back. That's why he's got a little sweat on his brow right now. He's like, man, I got money in the system right now. <laughs> so, all right, Ryan. So we're going to start early on. It's like, once again, I think we talked about this before the mics were working, is that, <laughs> is that you look really smart because the industry's popping right now, but this isn't something you just rock with. It's like something that's inside of you. You've yeah. been doing it since you were a kid. Most of us have done it at some point of our lives, but it's not our job. It's kind of like sure. lifting to me, right? Yeah. Or any of these guys' skills. A lot of people do these things as a hobby, but to make it your actual profession, whole different ball game. Yep. So like, let's start start early. Like, when do you start collecting cards, and then when does it transition to where all this might be like my real job? Yeah, sure. Yeah, so I've been in cards long, long time. Like it was, you know, early memories of Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon with yep. my cousins at school until they got banned. Right, kids were stealing them out of kids' lockers. Yeah. yeah. So quickly transitioned to sports cards in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. I had a kid I went to school with, his grandparents were buying on these nice expensive hobby boxes. But it was right around the same time that a guy that went to the same high school that I did, Donnie Nicky, yeah. had won a national championship with Ohio State and was now going to the NFL and had trading cards. So you seeing a guy you knew actually on a card, like yeah. he had his own card that tripped you out. Yeah, yeah, it was cool, right? As a, I mean, I was nine or ten at yeah. the time, right? I was from a town. I graduated with 130 people. Small what town did you grow up in? Uh, Plain City. Okay. Yep. yep. Uh, so just to see somebody like that succeed and get into the NFL and have cards, I was like, mm. this is cool. His mom was my art teacher. So uh, it was really, really cool. Um, and it was about 2006. Like, I really started getting into it. Um, that was about four years later where I was like, I got on the internet, got a cell phone, and spent a lot of time on, like, message boards mm. just every day making deals, trading with people through the mail, going to shows on weekends. Just, just hustling, hustling constantly. Yeah. It just, I grew up, like, we weren't wealthy, so it was mm. like, hey, you want to go out with friends? You want to buy this? You want to do this? Like, you got to get your own money. So it's yeah. like, I didn't want to be told no. So you just, you learn to hustle at a young age. So you were using your cash from when you were a kid from hustling cards. Yeah, yeah. I, I love mean, it. Flipping stuff. That's yeah. just always been about flipping. And uh, it was probably about 10 years later, right? I, uh I, Instagram was starting to take off for us a little bit. It was starting to get like popular. People were fading away from message boards. Social media for cards was starting mm -hmm. to become a thing. And I was telling my wife, I was like, I'm, I'm pretty good at this. I think this might be something I could do full time. Like, I don't want to get later in my life and look back and be like, I had an opportunity. I was good at this. I enjoyed this. Why didn't I ever do anything with it? Yeah. What was your regular job at the time? Uh, I was working at Verizon. Yeah. Doing what? A little call center. Yeah, Danny was doing that at Nationwide <laughs> when I found all well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wearing his tight khakis. Yeah, I mean, there's not much. <laughs> <laughs> all, them, all them lunges, boy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was, uh, it was definitely different. But this is uh, not for you. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I enjoyed it here and there, but yeah. Did you, though? <laughs> yeah. I'm just, I'm just there's, there's not, like, 
there's not much <laughs> like going into a call center with about 50,000 calls in queue and knowing you got to work that all day until all those calls are done. That's, uh, that's yeah. just, that weighs, that weighs on you. I'd rather uh, have 50,000 packs I'm about to rip yeah. open. <laughs> way, way more enjoyable. Uh, but yeah, 2016, right? My wife and I were about to get engaged and this is when like we're going through the process of like, hey, does this make sense? And I, I basically had the conversation with her. I was like, hey, let's, I'll prove it to you. Mm. I'll pay for the wedding through flipping cards. That would be Love a way that. to really show you that, like, hey, this makes sense. We can do this. Like, <clears throat> it was wasn't it like just go to the courthouse and get married. It was yeah, yeah, like an actual you, wedding. You had like a dope wedding, and you yeah, paid. It was very how cool. good did that feel? Like, oh yeah, she's walking down. She looks beautiful. Uh, you know, I'm about to get married, but I paid for this bitch Dude, with these cards, that's, boy. That's, <laughs> a, that's a big wang move. Hell yeah, yeah, it's a big wang move. Also, like yeah. at this time, like what were like your parents saying? Like what was everyone else around you saying? Yeah. Were they saying like, ah, we don't know about this? Or like what was that like? Yeah, I mean, my parents were pretty supportive through the entire time. My mom's always worked a couple jobs. Like my dad was very blue collar. So my parents were pretty supportive of it. Uh, but yeah, I mean, like m my wife. Uh, we talked about this. She grew up in a single mother household, so like guaranteed income was super yeah, important. Yeah, security. To my wife. Yeah, security is a big thing. Like, you know, when you're when you grow up in a single mom, like she's like that. Those things weren't guaranteed, mm -hmm. um, so it was very important to her. And then, yeah, I mean, a lot of like friends at the time, like the card market now is very different than yeah. it was six years. That's ago. why I tried to point that out. Right, like it wasn't something you told everybody in the world about. Like hmm. it wasn't like cool to be an entrepreneur. It wasn't yep. cool. It, like that wasn't the thing. And there's been a bunch of older people come back into it that are spending, like you said, crazy money. It's not just like a kid thing yep. anymore. Yeah, it's definitely uh, the, the business has changed Evolved. so much for sure. Um, but yeah, like it wasn't a. Uh, Hey man, I think you should quit your good, well-paying job and your career path. I think you should quit that and go trace baseball cards all day. Like mm -hmm. it wasn't a thing, so it was a uh, it was definitely a different conversation. But yeah, it I, it was definitely a great feeling, right? Paying for the Hell wedding, yeah. like showing like, hey, this this works. And I quit. I put my two weeks in. It never came back after my honeymoon, and that was kind of it. I think that I like the point because I think there's a lot of people that are in that position. They think they could do it. And there's significant other, this is the thing with Rachel, like I always found out, she's not going to think like me. Yeah. So she believes in me, Corey, but she might not believe in the project or yeah, she might not sure. believe in what's possible because that's not her. Yep. So what I had to do is through small things continually prove to her to where we are good. There yep. is security if that's what you call it. But the reality is that I can still produce and do these things that are outside of the box. And I think that right there. I think it was good, and I think it's really good advice for people that they could find things like that to prove it to their significant other. Not because they don't believe in them, because they really don't know. Yeah, they're not they're not wound like entrepreneurs. Yep. You know what I mean? So I mean, I mean, honestly, it sounds it sounds silly, but like looking back on it, I tell a lot of my card friends now. Like one of the things I did early on was like I would take money out of cards, and I would like let's go away for a weekend. Let yeah. me let me buy you this purse. Let me like small things. It wasn't like an everyday thing. Like I'm yeah. not. We weren't rolling, but it was like yeah, yeah. every little, like I would make a good bit on this deal, this big deal. I'd flip a $20,000 deal. We'd make a, a nice buck and be like, yeah. all right, here you go. This well, sounds like good strategy to me, kid. But it's just like <laughs> you're just buying goodwill. Like it's important. Yeah, the, it is. If, if the person you sleep next to every night isn't in your corner, it's, yeah, it's you're a, fucked. Yeah, it's an uphill battle for sure. Well, and they got to be able to sleep. That's what I started to realize. Like, my wife was a kindergarten teacher. You think she had, like, high-risk tolerance? I mean, sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, sure. and I'm telling her dad, who's an engineer for 25 years, that I want to be a personal trainer model. And he's looking at me like, where, where do you go? And I'm like, community college. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I've had those those wild looks. But I think the proving that is, is, is super key. Treway. How scared were you when you made that transition from your corporate job to doing cards full time? Honestly, I wasn't super, super scared. Like, I, I've always been pretty confident in my abilities in sports cards. Like, I've done this, like you talk about. Like, it's yeah. just, I mean, 16 years. Just now. in you, like, dude. Every day. Like, I didn't take years off. I didn't take months off. Like, every day, 16 years. I know it really, really well. I, I felt confident in it. And it was, it's just, there's something about having that chip on your shoulder that, like, hey, People are like, hey, stay in your, your corporate job. We need security. Like, there's just something about having that chip on your shoulder. I was I was ready for it. Yeah, I yeah. think that's one of the things that, that you and I connected on a lot, especially early on, because, you know, the discipline that I found through the gym and Corey, there are a lot of parallels, even though it's not the same space or, you know, the same disciplines, but, but the same principles apply, yeah. right? You are a hardworking dude. You grind, all that stuff. It's just put into, like, a different, like, yeah. Subject than what than what we it all do. applies. Yeah, absolutely. So it's the same thing. Trayvon. 
Oh, I'm curious, like, when did you, when was, like, the moment when you were, like, this isn't a hobby anymore, this could actually be, like, a business? Was there, like, a specific deal or something that went down where you were, like, oh, shit, like, I haven't made this much money from something like this before, and I'm, like, <laughs> okay, maybe this is something I can actually, like, make a living out of and support myself on? Yeah, I mean, it, it was definitely right around the t- same time I was paying for the wedding, right? There was a, I remember back in the day, this were, there was a deal with a Derek Carr one-of-one, one, like, one of those better cards. Mm-hmm. And I bought it on like Facebook for like $1,900 and traded it into like 40 different tarot car autos. The guy needed it to complete his like, in cards there's like a rainbow, right? So you have mm. a one of one, an out of five, an out of 10, an okay. out of 50. So there's only 50 made of this card, 10 made of this card, and you collect all of the different parallels. The guy needed like this one card. So he traded uh, me all of these. You had all the leverage. Yeah, I don't yeah. <laughs> Right, so then traded me this for like all of these really nice other Derek car autos. And this was the summer that like, Derek Carr had blown up. He was going to go into the next season. He was going to be a big deal. He was going to take the next step. And Derek Carr stuff went through the roof. Hmm. And I ended up making over ten grand on one card. And at the time, it's like I'm like I don't make this in months at work. What am I yeah. doing? And to see something, why am I spending all that yeah, time there? <laughs> yeah, to see something like that at, at a young, relatively young age, I was like, this is pretty cool. So yeah. I think that that Derek Carr deal, I look back on, I'm like, this was this yeah. was a big deal. Fuck yeah. yeah, that was like the fucking game changer. Yeah, that was definitely one of them. Danny. Um, I kind of want to rewind back to when you're talking about like your four years in the trenches, going to stuff on the weekend, um, and then just being on the message boards, like pre social media and stuff like that. Were, were there like people in that industry that you connected and networked with that kind of took you under your wing or did you have any people that you learned from specifically? No, not really. And I think that's one of the biggest reasons I'm so <coughs> into like creating content now is mm-hmm. I think when I look back on that. I didn't have that role model. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? There were I people that. locally that kind of did it that had card shops that I got a lot of advice from. But there was nobody online I could go and, like, follow their journey at card shows mm. and owning a card shop and that stuff. And that's, I think, why we document so much. Yeah. We, we try to create as much content as we do is because, I, you know, I want to be that person for younger kids now mm-hmm. because it wasn't around when I was a kid. It was the, – the content especially wasn't available. So. Yeah. Well, because the one thing – the one question I keep asking myself even, like, right now is, like – when I ask you, like, how do you learn how to trade cards? Like, just like a basic question like that. Like, where do you even begin with somebody? Yeah, that's a really, really tough question. Exactly. Right? Yeah, it's like, where do you even begin? Yeah, <laughs> so, cards yeah. now, we talked about it, you know, when you guys had just got here. But, like, cards are so different now. It, it, it is, while I enjoy it and I collect cards, it is definitely a hobby to so many. It's definitely a big business. I mean, yeah. look at the price of the boxes. We talked about it earlier. I mean, there are boxes mm-hmm. up there that have... You know, we talked 10 cards yeah. for $7,000. <laughs> <laughs> like, that's a real thing. Chew on that for me. Yeah, yeah, it blows me away. <laughs> right? I mean, that's... that's, that's I, I know I'm going to sound real old, but I was buying packs for 45 cents. Yeah, we don't sell like, those. Like, I used to I used to ride... <laughs> I, hey, so I used to ride my big wheel to the, the little grocery store I lived beside growing up and would buy cards for 45 cents. I mean, I sound like I had no shoes or something. Like, one of those <laughs> types of... But that's literally how long I was collecting cards ago. It's, or how long ago that was. It's, unbe- it's unbelievable how it's evolved. And if I think back, like, I had a couple deals that, like, made me some money in cards when I was, real, when I was like, probably, like, 10 or 12. And I was telling him I really paid attention to the vintage guys, which weren't vintage then. But, I mean, I guess they were because this would be, like, in the early 90s. It was, like, I had Bo Jackson, Deion Sanders. I had all these, you know, the Bo Breaker, all those. And this one kid came with the, just a pack full of all of his dad's stuff. And I'm looking through it. I'm like, O.J. Simpson, rookie. Joe Montana, yeah. rookie. Terry Bradshaw, rookie. Yeah. Fran Tarkenton, rookie. I'm talking, like, and he didn't care about him. I was like, you want all these new ones. So back to your point of how you, I was like, I understood who was great in the seventies. I don't know. I can't remember why. I don't know if his old, my my grandma had all these sports illustrates because there's no internet. So I think it was because I've studied Mm -hmm. the seventies Steelers, all of that. I started saying like, I knew these were common cards. I'm like, you're about to trade me all these. He's like, yeah, I don't even fucking care. I was like, bet. (laughs) I didn't say bet, but yeah, (laughs) give me that, you know? So I end up at a point where I've got thousands of dollars at the time in cards, his dad comes to my house and knocks on my door, on my trailer door, and was like, yo, like, we got to fix this. Like, my kid doesn't know what he's doing. These are all my, like, my card's worth a bunch of money. (laughs) So I negotiate with him, real talk. I sit down and say, listen, your kid made the deal. I was like, but I I, I understand. I mean, I'm like 12 years old. (laughs) So I still have some of these cards to this day. And so I go, here's, I want the Joe Montana. 
I want the OJ Simpson. I want the Fran Tarkin. There was like uh, Joe Green rookie. There was like five or six cards. I was like, I will give you back the rest, and you know, I'll trade them. I was like, but I'm keeping those. And he said, okay. <laughs> and so I reasoned with an old, an old dude, keep them. And uh, this is last story. Then I'll kick somebody else. I'd sell the Fran Tarkenton at my grandma's yard sale for $200, like two months later. <laughs> she sits there all day for four days. Rest in peace, grandma. She just passed away the other day. I get there for 20 minutes. I have a Fran Tarkenton and a, a Roger Starbuck that I got off this guy. Somebody pulls up, sees it. I make $225 and literally, and I pack up and she's like, are you leaving? I'm like, I think I... I think I'm good. She's like, you made. <laughs> she's like, you made more than I did in all three days in 20 minutes. And then at that point, I was like, this is this is how this works. <laughs> I think I was broken from that point on. <laughs> so anyway, that's my card story. So it sounds like it comes down to like time involved. Like you're saying, you <laughs> yeah. did it ever. Long winded. Day. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and again, like from when you were first collecting, there was what five, six, seven, ten products. Yeah, probably less than ten. I mean, we get twenty a month. Yeah, it's crazy. So it's just like the the variety. There's more. Main, uh, there's multiple sports, right? They've got now cards for F1, mm. UFC, WWE, like tennis, golf. Like there's so many more things that are a part of it. And so much of the business now is it's 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 a lot about prospecting. Mm. So just like that kid that was trading for you for Deion Sanders, yeah. and Bo Jackson, and guys like that. That's people now are coming in and buying George Pickens and Kenny Pickett yeah. and. Brock Purdy, Mr. Irrelevant, is one of the yeah, best selling so guys good. in the class, right? Well, it's, yeah, because you hope it's going to exactly. mature. Yep. Wow. That's all. It's amazing the product. What's wild is there's more products, but the newer cards are worth so much more money. That's where I think the flip's interesting because back then, I would get the newer cards. They were worth like $10 at a good card. I know it's all the yeah. money's different, but the vintage cards were worth more. And I know there is some select vintage cards, but you have a box of vintage. I just went through. Every time I come here, I buy some. I saw Larry Zonka for five dollars, but I can go over here and get a George Pickens cost fifty. It's like it's not the same parallel. Yeah. So, but there's more. So, how is there more products and companies, and is it just purely the scarcity of the amount? Like, why? What is the flip of how it, the newer shit got so much more valuable? Yeah, I think it's just like a a lot of it has to do with like FOMO. It's just like you want it. the next Tom Brady. Yeah, you want the next Jerry Rice. So what do you do? You buy the guys that have success early on that might become those mm. those people. And so much, that's literally all it is now is like, again, there's Patrick Mahomes that sell for millions of dollars. I know, it's crazy to Millions me. of dollars. Right? I mean, Mahomes is good. I think we can all agree that Patrick Mahomes yeah. is pretty good. But yeah, so much of it is, is just like, hey, I, I, George Pickens could be the next Randy Moss, the next Facts. Jerry Rice. I love George Pickens. I'm going to buy him. And I'm gonna hope it turns out to be that way. It, yeah. it, I mean, truthfully, it's 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 a dangerous game. Like, yeah. Because not everybody, George Pickens might not be Randy Moss. Yeah. Randy Moss and Jerry Rice are pretty good. Like, yeah, real good. Those, those guys are all time guys. Well, and that's the point is, it would be hard potentially to find a, a Rice or a Moss unless it's like the rookie high graded that there could be way more Pickens cards worth way more money. Okay. In theory, yeah. okay. you know what I mean. Yeah. So that's where I think it's a little bit interesting. Yeah, we sold uh, like we sold a George Pickens one on one, like it had a piece of the NFL shield on it. We sold that uh, last week for four hundred. Mm. That's sick. So, I think it is cool that they're adding things like that. I've been seeing that too, like where it adds like a swatch of this yeah. or something to that. I and, think that's interesting. And I think that's what like they talk about like that's what killed cards originally. Okay, like when you were collecting, they were they're all paper stock. They all looked the same. True. There, was, there was no autographs. There were no serial numbers. So you didn't know that there's only 50 of this card in the entire world. Mm. So the internet, you said the internet didn't exist. Yeah. So everybody in Maine and Texas and Florida had the exact same cards you did. And if you got an autograph, that was like unbelievable yeah, I mean, on the your first, card. The first pack pulled autographs weren't in there until like 96. I mean, there were some redemptions in the early yeah, 90s, yeah. but like it was a very scarce thing. Mm. So a lot of the cards were just, they were all the same. It was just different players in the set, but the cards were like... If Tyler Treadway had a Jerry Rice card from 91 Donners and you had one, they yeah. were the exact same. There yeah. was no parallel. There was no variation. There was no scarcity to it. Got it. They were the exact same thing. And it's just as time went on, Jerry Rice had a bunch of cards post-86, you know, his rookie yeah. year. They were all – there was nothing unique about them until the cards they have now that have autographs and patches that and makes game sense. pieces. They're, they're just different than they were. It's really a mix of memorabilia. 
in cards kind of coming together, which creates that, which is, which, cause they were really, and there are separate, but the reality is they've meshed more than ever at this point with yeah. that. I, and I think, so like the, the scarcity factor, right? Bringing in the uniqueness to it. it but it's also a lot like, like the stock market. Mm -hmm. You're, you're betting on some of these, you buy the blue chips, yeah. right? you buy your Amazon, your Apple, just like you can buy Tom Brady and Michael Jordan. Yeah. Those guys have done things. Those guys are safe, right? We talked about the T206, yeah, yeah, yeah. the Honus Wagner, Ty Cobb. Yeah. Those cards are safe. Those cards, T Ty Cobb's not going to do anything now that's going to affect <laughs> no. value, right? It's, <laughs> I don't it, think so. <laughs> it is what it is. But George Pickens, right, you can take some more investments and, and take risks on guys, and it's a yeah. lot like that. But they're actual tangible pieces. That's what makes cards cool, yeah, right, yeah. is you can go to a card shop. You can spend hours going through our 75 different boxes, yeah. looking through cards, cards from your – for, for your kid yeah, or yeah. from your childhood. Yeah, yeah, So that's what makes cars unique is the... I think it's the, the age group, the demo. Like, I can come here with Ann and then spend hours and yeah. we can just have an absolute blast, which is so cool. Yeah, and it, it, it doesn't also have to bank, break the bank, right? Like, yeah, no. our boxes up here that, again, we talked about are super expensive, but, you know, you can come in here and with 50 bucks and leave with a pile of cards. Yeah, which is what I try to do every time. Cool. Okay. First off, that was amazing. There's so yeah. much stuff. I just learned a shit ton. <laughs> um, so let's talk about like the transition from, all right, so you go full time. How does going full time, like, are you doing it in your house? And then how has that evolved to where we're sitting at right now? Like, what was the process of opening the store like? Yeah, that was, uh, that's been a journey for sure. Um, so I quit, like I said, I put my two weeks, went to, uh, went on my honeymoon, didn't come back. That was October of 18. So from October of 18 through May of 2019, it was all like, creating content from my house so like we would set up a little iphone open our mail open packs on camera that way then make deals on social media um ebay through, probably a lot right yeah a lot yeah. of ebay right <clears throat> i mean because you, you don't have a guaranteed paycheck so mm -hmm. it's like i gotta generate money so it was a lot of like content creation and then a lot of like flipping deals so like going to shows traveling for shows flipping stuff on ebay making deals through instagram um and then my lifelong dream has always been owning a card shop right i've been in this for so long remember going to card shops as a kid. I'm like, this is so cool. Imagine Same. getting to spend your, your time yeah. here. Like, this is awesome. Yeah. Like, I would want to do this. I love the face-to-face -face interaction. So it's super cool. So I'm like, I want to buy a card store. Well, in May of 2019, early May, the card store, it was right across the street. Uh, I've known the guy for 10 years. I mean, mm. my whole time in cards. And he was like, hey, I'm, gonna, I'm getting out. I'm moving. I want to sell the shop. And I'm like, this is quick, right? Like I just, I just quit my job six, seven months ago. Um, but I had a conversation with a couple of friends that I admire people. I look up to in cards that own shops across the country. And it just, it was, a, it made sense where it was like, Hey, this, this business is turnkey. So the way I looked at it was I could open the doors on day one and have people that know this shop exists that yeah. could walk right in the front mm -hmm. door. That's, that is a value to me. Yeah. It had an allocation. So what that means is the ability to get those boxes at wholesale pricing, right? That is where money. Yep. There's it was already set up. It was set up. Yeah. So there's money to be made there. And then I have an online presence that we were building that was growing. Um, so I was like, hey, if I can bring the online presence in store and push my retail store and I can bring the local customers and show them our online presence, it was a win. The, the rent was paid for for an entire year. So there was no real financial gain. I love that. There's no real financial <laughs> risk outside of the upfront cost to yeah. buy the, the store. I love the process of how you're working through this because yeah. that's what you have to do. It's amazing. So um, so our thought is, hey, we'll go through it for a year. If it doesn't work, we'll close. We'll take all the online. We'll, we'll bring our in-store customers online. We'll grow our online business instead. So I bought the shop in. We closed it for five days, renovated it, opened uh, May of 2019, and was going, going, and nine months later, COVID happened. Mm. Mm. And I remember sitting, I had no employees at the time. I had one kid that like worked for me, helped sleeve cards, like helped do some of this kind of stuff on the weekends. Um, and I remember I'm like, I just started, I have this card shop. They're gonna close the entire country, right? This is when like Vegas mm. shut down, the NBA shut down. Like <clears throat> sports aren't gonna exist. People can't go anywhere. People are gonna die. Like. This is terrible for my business. This is going to be awful. No one can walk in and buy anything I'm from like, me. <laughs> nobody. Like, yeah. This is so bad. So I sold some of my, like, I had a humongous Jason Tatum collection. I'm like, I can't eat these cards. I got to get some money. Tatum's jumper is money, bro. Yeah, I love, yeah. I love Jason <laughs> yeah. Tatum earlier. Yeah. Uh, so I sold some Jason Tatum stuff. I'm like, I got to have some cash ready. And we were closed one day shy of two months. It was like March 17th through May 16th. 
and we went online and sold boxes and broke them. We talked about yeah, breaking yeah, earlier. Yeah. And it it was crazy. Like people were at home, nothing to do, nowhere yeah. to go, getting money from the government. They're like, hey, let's rip some stuff. And it took off. And I was like, okay, well, I need somebody. So then I hired Dustin. Dustin was my first employee. He's uh, he's no longer here, but Dustin was yeah, yeah, instrumental in, yep. in, uh, in getting this place off. And we hired Dustin, and then we hired more people and more people. We needed somebody for accounting. We needed somebody for grading. We needed somebody for breaks. We needed somebody for eBay. So then we hired, and we grew. And so it was good. about – we so we May of 19, we opened there. In December of 2020, I bought this building. So That's we, sick. Yeah, we've been here for – year and a half so whenever you were hiring like your employees were they customers that you just knew who were like legit or yeah so some of them were so dustin was actually a guy he'd come in one time and we had we had hit it off um we were friends with we went to an ohio state game and then he'd come back in like right around the time that we were closing for covid and was talking and um you know we were friends outside of work and he was like yeah i don't really like my job um, you know maybe one day i'll work for you and i'm like i called my buddy and i was like i think i need an employee what about this guy? He's like, well, yeah, I sh- you should have hired somebody six months ago. Mm. So I, I, I asked He's like, Dustin, I got this guy. I'm like, I got yeah. this guy. So I offered Dustin the job the same day he said that. And he got, and it was so like good. a week later. He's like, I didn't expect it to happen so fast and it happened <laughs> quick. But yeah, most, I mean, some of them were like card collectors in the, the, the area. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean like it, it's different now because like my sister-in-law's work for me. That's so like cool. it's not only guys that know a lot about sports cards. It's people that like, that can talk to customers, that can post content. Like, it's different now. Like, when we were first started, it was all, like, how can we take this card for a dollar and sell it online for $2? Like, mm-hmm. it was yeah. all, like, transactional, growing it that way. And now it's a lot more, like, big business, content, different. It's 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 a lot different, but, yeah, it's crazy. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. The Raw Table Podcast is brought to you by Max from Muscle. With me is not only the Director of Sports Performance, Tyler Troy, but also the CEO, Mr. Corey Gregory. Mr. Gregory. Hey, thanks for the shout out here. Uh, listen, we got the I Want Abs 2023 going on right now. That registration will open on January 1st. If you would like to win a Cadillac truck, or I heard maybe even a Gucci watch. Potentially. Potentially. Yes. <laughs> yes. There's some amazing <laughs> things. So if you would like to get abs, and then you'd like to look like Turtle on... Uh, turtle on Entourage. On you know, Entourage. I got a lot of fans saying that's what I look like, so <laughs> I would agree. That could happen happen for you i would love to have you be ripped fly to columbus and take away and escalate so at maxovermuscle.com on january 1st make sure you register anything trebway get abs and we're back all right where were we at ryan you were talking about oh you made the you had covid hit uh, you had the transition, you were selling online, you were hustling your Jason Tatum stuff, and then let's talk post-COVID. Post-COVID, wow. So, so you go, you, you buy this building is what yeah. you kind of finished at. So what made you also, because you purchased this personally, right? So yeah. now we're sitting in Card Collector 2. You own the building yeah. as a business. I'm assuming renting it to yourself. Yeah. You have your own business online, content, like... Now, like you said, it went from you hustling cards, so this is a legitimate business. There's people that work in the business that don't necessarily know cards. Yeah. They're actually executing jobs. So it's like, talk about that transition, because that is a transition. Yeah, I mean, COVID did, like looking back on it, like COVID was crazy for our business. Right? Yeah, it, it was good it, for your business. It blew, up, it blew up a lot of things, but it also showed us that like, hey, I, I don't want this to go away. Because mm. um, you realize at the beginning of COVID, like before any of this happened, you look back, it's it's been three years now. Yeah, like you true. look back on it and you're like, this could go away immediately. So now it's like, how do you build this into something that lasts forever? Mm. So yeah, that's why like we bought the building, right? I was paying rent, renting it. Like I didn't own any of it. Now I own it, paid it myself. And hopefully this place is in business for a long, long, long time. But at the end of it, I'll own it. Right. Exactly. So it's just like part of that was diversifying and getting into other assets and having things that made sense outside of sports cards. Right. Because yep. When, when it first started, it was like, hey, this could go away in a blink of an eye. Then I have a bunch of sports cards that are pictures of guys on cardboard. Maybe not everybody wants those, <laughs> right? Like maybe, When you break it down like that, yeah, that's funny. Right? Maybe not everybody wants those, but a piece of real estate, that's a that's a good long-term investment for sure. I know that, and that's that's different than my line of work. So if sports cards – I always got the piece of advice. It said if sports cards are good, you're good, mm. right? We're in sports cards. We're very into sports cards. But if they're bad – 
it's it it could be detrimental. Yeah. Right. If sports cards, if everything in here dropped seventy five percent, like that's that's a big hit. Yeah. But yeah. real estate, right? That's a different piece. And again, it was just it was diversifying there. So uh, th that was one of the reasons we went with the with the, with buying the building. Yeah, yeah. But in terms of like the like the content, it was when, when COVID happened, it, it blew up. Like people are at home looking for things to do, like looking for old hobbies and sports cards. We were a big player in sports cards at the time, and it just. It happened yeah. so quick, but I mean, we ended up hiring like a full time videographer. We had full content time content people. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, I don't know if I answered your question exactly. I think you got there. But, I want to I want to throw it to Trey because I watched Trey in his world with the vintage clothes. Yeah. Do the same thing. Trey would be uh, selling a lot of gear, flipping it into the stock market, kind of like diversifying the assets. Yeah. I guess my biggest point is, and I'll let Trey weigh on this. Like, this is an asset class now that a lot but some people still don't look at it like that sure. yeah. but you need to just like a stock just like real estate and i yep. think that's really interesting so I'll yeah. throw to you, i mean Trey. like me and chad were having this conversation the other day like i think like just having a business like this like cards for example is something that's so amazing to me because to be able to like take something that's a hobby as like a child or like something that you just gen like you just generally actually enjoy it you would do it even if there wasn't money involved yep. in the yep. first place like to make a actual business something you can support your life off of like like that is yeah. fucking amazing to me like because like it's unbelievable yeah like ca like cards or like or like me and Tradway were talking like Pokemon cards like me and Tradway were sending shit on Pokemon cards to the PSA <laughs> a couple years ago like making like a decent amount of money but like to be able to even like have the opportunity to do something off of that like off of Pokemon cards something that we just genuinely actually love like mm. it's fucking awesome I I honestly feel that same way about lifting weights to be honest like it's uh, every day I have that same kind of feel like this is a uh, this is a hobby for a lot of people, but it's not your hobby. Oh. I've been trying to remind people that lately in my content of like working out because, you know, I'm still collecting cards. I can walk in my, my library where I've got all my books and I've got all the cards there. A lot of the ones I bought here most recently, it kind of reinvigorated some of the vintage stuff and it's probably the most less expensive stuff you got. So I'm always like coming out here with piles of them, but it's like one of those things like that's my, that's like a new, it's my hobby again, which is what working out is for a lot of people. But then you hear all the layers of the business part of it. It's so intriguing and to Trey's point, like to then transition that to where you paid for the wedding and you've grown it. But I would say, if you don't do the content side of it, it yeah. doesn't happen, Ryan. Like my kid watches your videos. Like <laughs> I told him I was coming to do a video. Like he thinks you're way cooler than I'm ever be. You know what I mean? Like it's like, but yeah. it's amazing because that is the difference. And I was able, and I'm a little older than you, but I was able to adapt from a guy that had no internet, no content. I was reading muscle magazines, but when it was time, I was able to like adapt and do that. And that's why my business did what it did. Yeah. And I, I, I was you ended up getting there, but that's exactly the point I would say when like Trey was talking about it. It's like being able to do something you love every day is a privilege. Oh my God. But being able to inspire the world to do it every day yeah. is, is also it's a privilege. Unbelievable. So it's like, I, I know for sure I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for the content. Yeah. No, for sure. Like the content was a big piece in it. Like nobody was, again, I told you like nobody was documenting what it's like to own a card store and no. traveling the country, going to card shows and opening different mail days and opening breaks and interviewing athletes. Like that's why we do it is like, hell yeah, nobody else is like, there's way more people now. Every, a lot of people do it. Um, but like back then it was so you were like, one of the first to market on. Now. Yeah, it was cool. Like there wasn't a lot of content you could get online and watch somebody go to a card show, <clears throat> spend $10,000 in a couple hours buying different deals, why they're buying, how they're buying, what that's like. It was just, yeah, it's cool. It's definitely something. You could see like that's how you then created legacy clients, which is the exact same thing I was able to do with the free workouts from MP, from the videos, bodybuilding.com. I was able to create clients that have continued and customers and really family that have like followed my family grow up, followed like the training, followed the ups and downs and like are still there supporting yep. what I'm doing, what max effort is. And that that right there is how you do that. Yeah, it's, it's funny. I, t I tell the story a lot, but like, uh, looking back on this, this is like early, early Instagram days. I, uh, I was going to pick up a card in Dublin. I lived over in New Albany at the time and driving home from the, the picking up the card. I found out one of my friends was killed in a car accident. Hmm. And the same day I picked up the card, I interacted with a guy that, that I ended up trading it to three years later it was in my wedding. The same day wow. I lost a friend in a car accident. I went, picked up this card that I ended up making a lifelong friend out of on the exact same day it happened. And it's like the content piece of it, like 
there were people in Instagram. We met through Instagram. Yeah. It wasn't like we like we knew each other from like a local thing. Like we met through Instagram through cards. Ended up becoming a. It was in my wedding. Still talk to him to this day. Um, but yeah, it's just crazy. Like where the connections and what the what the content has been able to. Every guy sitting at this table knows me from the content. Yeah. (laughs) Every one of them came through free workouts. (laughs) Isn't that funny? Yeah, that's crazy. It is crazy. Cole tweeted me when he was 15 how to ask me how to take creatine. Yep. And then he answered, and then I got my dad to go buy it for me. Yeah, we've been homies since. (laughs) It's pretty cool. Back to you, Treadway. Yeah, so this is less of a question, but more I just want to kind of give you your flowers because, Ryan, I've, I've been coming. I've been a customer since, uh, like, the old shop, and just the drive and passion that you have is is unmatched, and not a lot of people have it. You know, I see it with Corey. I see it with everybody at this table, but everything that you've put into this has been, you know, spectacular, and you do it from the, the good of your heart, and you're one of the most determined, driven people I've met, especially through like, you know, we start working with like some training stuff and stuff like that. Ryan's up every day, text me, send me videos. Like he's just a very passionate person. But, but to pose that as a question, what keeps that passion alive in you? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I appreciate the kind words for sure. It's, uh, it's been fun getting to know you guys right through Treadway and just getting to see your guys' world as well. It's, it's definitely very inspiring. Um, yeah, I, I think regret plays a lot of it. Like, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I don't want to look back 50 years from now and be like, man, I wish I would have tried a little bit harder. I think that drives me a ton. Yeah. Too, I just like, you only get to do this once, but if you do it right, once is enough. So it's like, I, Ooh, I like that. Yeah. I Clip just, that Kyle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah I just, if you only, if you do it right once, you only, or what'd you say? Yeah, if you, you do, do if, if it you only get to do it once, but if you do it right, once is enough. Yeah. Man. That's what. That is what. Put that on a t-shirt. <laughs> but right. yeah, that's right, Danny. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. you think so? Like so? Yeah. To that, to elaborate on. So if you're having every listen, we all deal with dumb stuff in business constantly, right? But it's like when you're getting you're up against taking a chance or buying a card or doing something that's you have to really put some thought to it. Is those the type of things that kind of run through your washing machine? Like I don't want to regret that I didn't like try this or give this my all or you know what I mean? Yeah, I'm very big on like just me as a person, how I'm wired, I'm like, what does this decision lead to? Like, if I go Mm. down this road, what does this decision lead to? What does, in terms of, like, big business decisions? Uh, But, yeah, it's just, like, I don't know. I just feel very fortunate to be able to wake up every day and get to do what I love. So, I don't know. I just... Yeah, I don't. I don't want to look back years from now and be like, man, I wish I wouldn't have done this. I wish I wouldn't have done this. wish I wouldn't have done this. Like, I just... you, You have that opportunity now. Like, and in terms of, like, the training, right? I was never really into it, but it's like... Tyler and I have talked a lot about it. It's like you only get one body, right? You only, only get, one, get one. It's like, so it's, it's important to me. Like I'm not the biggest dude. I'm not, but it's just like one day at a time, 1% better. That has yeah. major results over the course of a year. So it's just, it's the compound effect of just like you saw your business. So yeah. that's why I always tell people like they want the results tomorrow, just like they do in business. Yep. And that you said 16 years or whatever the number yep. was like, it's the same in the gym. It's a, it's in all these things. And especially in today's culture, they want it tomorrow. And there are some hacks that can get you there a little faster, yep. but there's nothing that's going to replace all these levels of areas you had to go through proven at the wedding, buying the card shop. Yep. Out. Like those are all like kind of part of like your own version of college. You got to go through basically yep. to learn all these things. And I was just watching for, some from Dame dash the other day where he said like, just line up all the problems and let me just knock them the hell out because that's the way you're going to grow. And these guys have known me long enough. They see me deal with a bunch of dumb shit and they've all done with their own, you know, dealt with their own dumb shit. And it's like how you get through it and and go to the next level. And it's like, that stuff is going to I think I used to have this fantasy that you get to a spot and you're just cruising. Yeah. Doesn't work like that. Right. Right. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. You just, you know, you think that like, you're going to get to this point and I'm like, Oh, I'm going to retire at 35. I'm not going to do anything else ever again. But like, I used to have that, that dream all the time. I was like, I want to get to 40 and never work a day yeah. in my life. I, I don't want to work. I used but to I'm think like, that too. But I'm like, I wouldn't want to do anything else all day. Like, this isn't work to me. Like, I get to do this every single day. Like, why would I ever want to stop? Maybe I'll slow down. Maybe I don't travel as much. Like, maybe things yeah. are different, but like, I wouldn't want to do anything else. Like, this is what I'm so, good at. This is what I enjoy. I think that comes from, me and Cole talked about this before. I think that comes from the blue collar somebody works 30 years doesn't like their job and they want to retire to do what they love to do sure so i think that that's ingrained in us as young people i know for me for sure with being yeah. a coal miner like 
you know, the guys get done and then they live for five more years and then they have some health problem and they die. Yep. And I'm like, I'm not about to put in 40 to get five of what I, what I want. And then when I got older and got a little bit of cash and I was like, okay, if you just give me five times that amount of money, what would I do tomorrow? Is it Monday? Probably go deadlift. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably still talk shit to these guys. You know what I mean? Probably still want to do some content. Like I started to realize, I told Rachel, I was like, I don't really think that's like a thing for me. I think I get to do and, I'm, and, and work with the people I really like and we're, we're on a common goal. Like that is the sauce, dude. Yep. That is the sauce. It's not the other thing. I think I'd be bored. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. That, I think that's so key. I saw one of my, my good friends, dad worked 30 years and died in 18 months after retirement. That's what I'm saying. I saw I'm like, the that, same thing. That sounds miserable. Like, I'm not signing up, up for day. that. No, it's like, I'll get to do this and I'll do it as long as I can and I'll enjoy it and yeah, I wouldn't want to. I mean, you get to build it every day with people. Like, again, like my sister in laws work for me. Like they don't know anything about cards. Like, yeah. They didn't know anything. So it's like it's fun to come in every day and build this with people I care about. It's mm -hmm. it's cool. Like the, I post pictures all the time. But that shop across the street was 550 square feet, had no air conditioning, and the Wi Fi was sketch, so good. Sketches can be. Yeah. Right. I mean, when we opened, we had like 11 hobby boxes on the shop. Now we have 175 different products in our store that are hobby boxes alone. <laughs> like it happens. Like it, it's cool and. Yeah, I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to do anything else. It's awesome. Danny, back to you. <clears throat> yeah, uh, one thing I keep thinking about as you talk about the different areas of your business is, like, the overall system. So, like, do you kind of view yourself as, like – because I, I view myself uh, in some regards with, like, Corey's business uh, as, like, a – you know, as, like, the conductor of the orchestra, and you have these different, like, aspects to, to manage, whether it's eBay content, the actual fiscal storefront, the online sales. Like, how do you – kind of like, or how did you like build that business or how did you like go through the iterations to get to where you are today, I guess, or how difficult was that for you? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely been a learning curve. Like there's not a book on like, Hey, how to run a successful sports card business in 2022. Mm -hmm. So a lot of it's been like, <laughs> maybe you could create that, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> or I think maybe you are creating that. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there's not like really like a, a guide for it. It's just kind of like a lot of it's learning mm -hmm. and like, I, I'm not as much the conductor. That's not my thing. We have, you know, Brian does a lot of the stuff for me. He's a lot of the hands-on, day-to-day, managing people, doing that, a lot of the, the business type stuff. Mm -hmm. I like doing a lot more of the, like, content, filming, growing the brand through that, that piece. And that, that took a lot of time to get to mm -hmm. because I think one of the things I struggled with early on in my business was delegating. Mm -hmm. Like, I, I've always said there's – like. If you bring me a four row box of cards and say, Hey, I want this for it, I, I was like I tell my team all the time, there's one thing I'm very confident in, it's my ability to buy and sell baseball or football cards. Yeah. Like I'm very good at that. But like pricing basketball singles or buying a vintage yeah. deal, like I don't know that stuff as well. So my specialty is buying football, creating content. Like I really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. And it took me a long time to realize that like letting go of some things and putting people in position to succeed that way, mm -hmm. it was going to be a lot more successful for our business in the long run. Like the eBay page, like Ashton runs our eBay page. He's the, like he scans it, he lists it, he ships it. He does almost all of it. Mm -hmm. And like that has taken a lot of time to get to, but it's, it's definitely been one of the reasons we've been able to grow is me being hands off on so much more and focusing on the things that actually grow the business and are things I truly enjoy doing a lot more. Yeah, that's huge. I think each one of us, like in our like different silos in max effort and Corgi fitness and stuff like that, like, Corey kind of entrusts us all. We all feel like we're kind of running our own little, like, yeah. you know. Well, business. I used to do every one of your jobs. I was really bad at Cole's job. <laughs> <Shout> <laughs> and, and these two guys' jobs. And then, I mean, Danny, like, yeah. What? I couldn't, <laughs> yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't keep, I couldn't keep things on track. Like, so you, I you remember mean? I was just lighting, I was just lighting a fire to stuff. So I just realized like the same thing about myself. I'm good at those things. Yep. And I enjoy those things. And the other, the other thing I was going to ask you too, if this is selfishly for me, but it's like when you have to do the business stuff though, Ryan, you have to look at the spreadsheets. At some point you're the CEO. Yeah. yeah I see the way you already give me that. <laughs> he already does. Right. <clears throat> I struggle with these guys have seen it, especially recently. I've had a lot of that stuff going on. I'm going through that stuff. I'm looking at the cash. I'm margin costs are up. And then, yep. you know, Danny goes, gee, I need three daily fires. And I go, uh, probably not. To. Like, I have a hard time flipping. I know it's two different parts of your brain. Yep. I have a hard time flipping from that business, Corey, 
to content Corey. They're the same guy, but they're not the same guy. So do you struggle with that at all, or do you even plan them on the same days, or have you had any issues like plan, that? Plan one on the same Plan days. like, okay, this is like a day where I'm gonna have to handle like business stuff, buying stuff, spending money, costs, overhead, and then I can still go shoot a YouTube video and it come out the same way. Yeah, so buying stuff in our business is the best is the best part. That's how okay. we make money. So I enjoy buying stuff. Yeah. But the business stuff, like the tax. Yeah, there you the, go. Give me some of the stuff you don't like oh, doing. Yeah. <laughs> tax. And then can you create at the same level? That's what I'm trying to get. Yeah, at. it's like those are the those are the days I absolutely dread. Yeah. Um, it is. I definitely feel less productive on those. Days yeah, yeah. Sure, right. <laughs> less like, creative, less yeah, productive. Yeah. When you have when good, you have to it's sit not just me. And, yeah. Look at you know. 401ks and documents and time yeah. off and uh, taxes and cat you know cat tax and income yeah. tax and all and cat all, tax yeah. is a bitch yeah, so all these stupid. taxes yeah. it's like I mean thank thank goodness I have good you know business advisors and yeah, accounts of course. like th those guys are, are worth their money for sure um, but yeah those those days are hard like it, it is hard to look at this and be like well this money's going here this money's going here this money's going here I got to do this I got to respond to this I got to send this I got to give somebody this like. And then I got to create a piece of content. It's like, those are the days I definitely don't feel as creative. Yeah. Um, so. That's why I've been trying to schedule, like, if I know I have a day upcoming like that where I just can't dodge it, which is what I try to yeah. do as much as possible, then I usually try not to plan something like this today yeah. because I just, I'm not going to feel, if I would have went through a bunch of business stuff before I got here, I'm, I don't feel like myself as much. Yeah, sure. So yeah, we're uh, at least that, it's not just me then, I guess. But I think that's one of the things like we need to work on the most. Like you said, scheduling. Like we, yeah. that has been the biggest thing for us. And Tyler asked me all the time, like, "Hey, where are you going this weekend?" I'm like, no, "I'm not sure. We'll find out tomorrow." Like we'll book so we'll, like we yeah. book flights 48 hours before we leave. <laughs> like I, I, I tell Tyler all the time, like you know, we went to Philly. I was in uh, Chicago. Got back. Was in Memphis. Like we got back from Chicago. We flew there Thursday night. Got back Saturday midday, flew to Memphis Monday morning, was in Memphis for like 20 hours, flew back Tuesday morning from Memphis, and then flew to Philly on Thursday, was in Philly from Thursday, <laughs> Friday, Saturday, and it's like all of those flights were booked within at no more than 72 hours. Most of them were 24 hours. That's amazing. So it's like a lot of that stuff we just booked so like – and it, it, it definitely falls on me, and that's something like you know, I'm learning, hmm. but – yeah, the scheduling piece is definitely something. We, we I used to do, a, back in the MP days, I did a lot of one-way stuff too because I didn't know how long I was staying for. Yes. Yeah, and so I used to ride like that. And, and it never bothered me. Some people that bought their yeah. personality, they can't do that. Yeah. For me, it was like not a big deal, which is why I never got probably super scheduled because it never really bugged me. Yep. But then like Danny's like my schedule guy, right? Yeah. So like if, it, <laughs> you know, but I but we need that part of it. That's my point. But it's like. I operated that same way for a really long time, but it doesn't mean that's the best way to <laughs> yeah, operate. Sure. Yeah, but like I said earlier, there's not like a there's not a, like a manual or a how yeah. to on this. You just a lot of it you figure out on the fly and adjust and try to get better every day. That's good. Cole, anything else? Yeah. So, for a young kid who's looking up at you, he's like, "That's what I want to do." What's like the one piece of advice like you would give them? That's a good question. Uh, I, and it's funny. I asked this. I asked good this. Good podcaster, Cole. <laughs> We do. There's a piece of content we do um, where we interview some like car shops, collectors, uh, guys like that, and I always ask them like, "Hey, what's one piece of advice if you're starting over?" Um, I, I would say, so like, if I was starting over, like the piece, I'll I'll take my question. Like, enjoy the process, right? The the journey is more fun than the destination for sure. Like you guys talked about it, like shooting the shit with everybody, yeah. building it with people you care about. Um, one piece of advice. Um, that's a really good question. It's deep. Yeah, it is. Um, cause I'm thinking about, you know, 16 years of it. It's like, what would I, what would I tell my younger self today? Um, um, make as many connections as possible. There you go. Yeah. Good connections, right? Like keep good people close. That would, that would be my mm. advice. Keep good people close. Right, like, and I t Dustin doesn't work here anymore. Mm. I tell, I've told this to Tyler. I've told this to a couple of the people that I, that work with. Dustin was like the first person I hired. He was like my brother. Mm. Like we were really, really close. But then it got more business. Yeah. Like, COVID did things to our business. Like I mean, we went from no employees to eight employees in six months. Like it happened very, very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and as you know, I was 27, 28 at the mm -hmm. time. Right, like you go from zero employees to eight employees traveling all over the country, documenting big deals, brand deals. Like it happened so quickly. And I think I focused less on the business and 
what made it like a family business and mm. like the people like I focused less on I just didn't care about it as much I was so focused on like how do I build this thing as big as possible as sure. fast as possible like how do I create something you had the juice right then you were yeah, running with it but... yeah that, that was what it was like we were we were really trying to run with it and I think looking back on it I would have done things a little differently mm -hmm. that would have kept people I cared about here longer. Like we have great people now. I love the people I work with, yeah. but there were people I was really close with the people I will be close with forever that I still talk to. They just don't work here anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think looking at that, I would keep good people close. That's part of the learning process though, yeah. of all that. Like there's, like you said, there's no handbook when all of a sudden the world gets shut down, but your business grows. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's weird. It's backwards. That's like I said, why I sold stuff. It's just, I think if you go back and you tell somebody, Hey, the world's going to shut down. You can't go anywhere. You can't travel anywhere. And this disease is going to travel and kill people. Like, yeah. do you think sports cards are going to be hot? I don't. Most people would probably say no. That seems like the logical thing. And I was super busy too with online workouts. Same type of thing happened. Yeah. I was busier than I had been. It was it was one of my biggest years. Yep. It was wild. Yep. Trayvon. Yeah. I mean, I don't have anything, but Good. just like that year though, like uh, anything like online, like just popped off. Like yeah. it was like, like it was like Pokemon cards, sports cards, like vintage clothing, like anything that you could just like people just had free time where so much they free had time. free time and they're getting like stimulus checks and they're just like, what, a, what even do we free time to work out? Yeah, they're, they're like, what, what do we want to spend it on? Basically. But, but, I, but I, and I think that that hits on a point though. And that's one thing that I've always been like proud of for like content is when you start first round putting out content, on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Snapchat, wherever. It doesn't cost any money. Yeah, you facts. have guys now that help you with it, right? Yeah, that, yeah. that can do it in, in a more professional setting. Dude, I, I had my iPhone, yeah. some time, and I put it down. I said, I think somebody will watch this. It doesn't cost any money. Nah. That's one thing I always tell like card shops and friends that are trying to get in the business. Like, You should document everything. It doesn't cost any money, but you could have the best product, the best people, the best service, you could be the best anything. But if nobody knows who you are, if Facts. nobody can find you, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. Damn. That's, ain't that the truth? Danny, anything last thing? Um, I mean, we talked about COVID, but outside of COVID, has there been any other, like, real, you know, bouts of adversity that you had to overcome? There's anything come to mind? Yeah, sure. I mean, we had some stuff where we uh, had a bad business deal. Cost us a good bit of money, a little mm -hmm. bit of reputation at the time. Like, mm -hmm. had to right some wrongs there. Um, that was definitely a, a time where we had where we learned a lot, right? I sure. think it goes back to my point earlier mm -hmm. about not being focused on things that mattered and being focused on the wrong stuff. Yeah, yeah. Um, you're just growing too quick. So yeah, I think that slowed us down a lot. And again, it goes back to the point about COVID. But like, you realize how quickly you can lose everything. <laughs> yeah. So for real, really puts a lot of things into perspective when you're like, hey, I spent 16 years building this. I don't want to really lose it overnight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah, th there's there's been a couple, but, but that one sticks out. Yeah. But you just I, kept going. I yeah. appreciate the honesty there because yeah. I think that people need to know that, look, you don't get it all the way right all the time. Yeah. But you got to make it right. Or the next time around, then you you, you know the pitfalls. Mm -hmm. it's smart. Yep. Yeah. They're, uh, as long as you learn from them, I think that's what matters, right? It's oh. just, if not, you're just going to keep repeating it and keep making the same mistakes. That's the definition of insanity. Treadway? <laughs> so what what's your why? What's your what's your driving force? Like Ryan Johnson, your reason for waking up every day and doing the same thing. I know it's not the cards on the shelf or the yeah. cards you have in a in a safe. It's it's something different. So what is that for you? That's a good question. I don't. I mean, it's it's got to be my family, right? Like my, my wife, you know. She yeah. I mean, my, my wife comes from a pretty pretty rough situation so like the fact that like she, i'm gonna get emotional but like yeah i appreciate it um but yeah like she doesn't uh she didn't come from a lot and mm -hmm. just to see like i think that's the big thing i look back on is like people that were in early like you can't buy that like yeah somebody that saw it they before, believe yeah, then yeah yeah somebody that saw it before you did for sure man that's that feels good to give yeah. her those experiences yeah, that like, you get now huh and i think that's the big thing is like i think a lot of like through the journey i'm like I always wanted to prove people wrong. Like I wanted to tell somebody like, Hey man, like you were wrong. Like I was right. But I think the best thing is proving somebody right. That like believed in you from the beginning rather than like proving somebody wrong. Like it's better to be like, Hey, this guy believed in me. Here's what I became. So I think that, that my, my wife is, is by far my wife. Shit, I don't know yeah, if we can powerful. close it anywhere that I'm going to, this is just one like collector's question. What's your favorite, what's your, what's your grail favorite card? Do you own it? Will, will, you probably will own it one day if you don't uh, currently. Like, what? what is that for you? What is the Holy Grail card for Ryan? Yeah, so the the two cards for me that, like, 
to me are like sports cards for Ryan yeah. are Tom Brady contenders rookie auto. Okay. We talked about that earlier, but yep. he doesn't have a lot. It was pick 199, so kind of like it wasn't like Peyton Manning, right? Number one draft pick. Yeah. Expected to be good. So like the underdog thing in Brady and the scarcity behind that and growing up a Patriots fan, there like you go. to me, the Brady contenders. And then it's the 52 mantle. Yeah, that's so sick. Right? Like that to me is when I say baseball card, I think of that card. That is the so baseball card. As a young you. collector, again, I've done this for so long. Like when you grow up and you see that card, what that means in sports cards, those are the cards. And thankfully, I own both of them, but those to me are – are the cards for me. So sick. Where can everybody find you at, Ryan? Yeah, I mean, anywhere on social. Card Collector 2, YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. This was unbelievable, first off. I mean, I like doing the on location, too. Yeah, this is awesome. Pretty so, fun. Yeah. So this is a roundtable. I'm your boy, Corey G, at Small Arms Danny, at Trey Speed and the graphic gangster himself, Cole Susak, with the bearded one, Tyler Treadway. Ryan, we appreciate you, bro. It was appreciate awesome you. being here. Thanks for coming. All right, we'll see you guys later. We out.